Hi everyone, this is Kiwi coming to you from Compassion International. This month, Compassion is so proud to partner with all of you to help provide meals to mothers and babies through our child survival program. Since infant mortality rate is so much higher in some developing countries, our first priority in promoting effective child development is to ensure that babies survive the early years when they are most susceptible to disease and malnutrition. That means supporting and educating our mothers on how to provide critical care before and after her child is born. Every five check-ins this month will provide a day of care to a mother and a baby. So remember to check in this month. Good morning, everyone. If you can stand today, let us worship God together. Come on. Put our hands together. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to the hope beyond. Our creation waits with an expectation. Let 
Every time I face the waves I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid I don't want to fear the storm Just because I hear it roar I don't want to fear the storm I'm not gonna be afraid Cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid No, I'm not gonna fear the storm You are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm
Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. God, I pray that right now in this moment, I can feel the Holy Spirit, God. It's here. It's moving, God. And I thank you for that. As we lift our voices to you today, God, and we worship and praise you, we do so in remembrance of the most beautiful gift, the most beautiful sacrifice this world's ever known, God, the crucifixion of your son, Jesus. We thank you so much for that sacrifice and so much for the blood spilled and the torture he went through, God, so that a sinner like me, a worthless sinner like me, could find worth in you, God. My prayer for us today is that you would speak into our hearts, God. Speak, speak truth. Let us learn something from you. Even if we've been coming to church our entire lives or if this is our first time, God, teach us something new today. In your heavenly name, I thank you so much. In the name of Jesus. morning everyone you may be seated amen thanks guys thanks just that is what our greatest prayer is isn't it my greatest prayer for you that you'd know that peace before you leave here today that the peace the world doesn't understand or know that that peace would be really truly felt here in this place um, if you're brand new welcome my name is pastor doug and uh, in a moment, we're going to take up our morning offering, and if you are new, we just want one thing from you. If you just take a moment right now, and there's a Connect card there in your bulletin. Hopefully, you got a bulletin when you came in. Um, if not, there's one in the seat back right in front of you. Just pull out that, rip it off, and just fill that out. Um, you won't have anything happen other than maybe a phone call and an email. And we just like to connect with you. So if you want to put that as the offering plate comes by in just a moment, that would be great. Or you can take it to our Connect Center and there's a gift there for you. Or today, because it's Communion Sunday, we have our uh, hospitality, our welcome room. And there's not a lot of, uh, some of you that I have not gotten the opportunity to connect with yet. And myself and the rest of the staff, we will be out there in the welcome room love to meet you, greet you face to face. So come on out after the service and we'll just have a, just a brief time afterward today. Well, we're going to take up our morning offering in just a moment here. And you know what excites me as a pastor of this church to see all of the many changed lives. You know, in the last year, we've had over 40 baptisms, people who have stepped forward and said, I want to follow Jesus and they want to do it publicly, and they've gone through these waters of baptism, and that's what it means to me, to see these lives transformed right before our, our lives. And so when you give, you're giving to things like that. You're giving to um, next Sunday, Mother's Day, we've got a number of young people, children, infants that are going to get uh, dedicated here, and you're giving to things like that. It's such an exciting thing to be here in this place. So thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, ushers, why don't you come forward right now? Let's take up this morning's offering. And just a couple of other things. Um, for those of you who are members, this coming Thursday night, we have a, a very informal town hall meeting. Our constitution is getting revised, and you can come to that meeting Thursday night at 7 o'clock and really just get an idea a little bit of kind of what the changes are taking place in the Constitution, the new Constitution. You can ask any questions you'd like. So come on out at 7 o'clock this coming uh, Thursday. Love to have you there at that meeting. Uh, got a number of different things coming up as well, so check out your uh, bulletins. We, be we begin a brand new series today, and it's called Love Goals. Pastor Matt's going to be out here in just a moment. Uh, preaching and before that we're just gonna watch uh, just this quick video on our announcement our announcement video let's do that right now hey there everyone my name's Brittany and welcome to Faith Church and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us before we continue in our service we'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around faith so check this out 
If you're new here at Faith Church, we want you to feel at home. So no matter your background or current situation, just know that this is a safe place, and we're so glad to have you here. We also want you to know that there's a place at Faith Church that's perfect for you. Church is so much more than just a Sunday service, and if you're ready to get started, the best way to do that is grab the card in your bulletin that says Connect Card. Take a second to fill out a little bit of information about you, then drop it in the giving bags when it comes down your row later today. And that's it. Later this week, one of our pastors will connect with you. And once again, thanks for being here. Here at Faith, we get excited every time someone makes the decision to get baptized. It's one of those unique moments where we get to see a vivid picture of what Jesus has done in someone's life. In June, we'll be hosting baptisms here in the service and celebrating together. If you're ready to get baptized or simply want to know more, sign up on your Connect card or at faithauburn.info. Someone will be in touch with you this week and help you take this next step in your faith journey. We believe that the local church is the hope of the world. One face-to-face -face moment with God can change everything. That's why serving and caring for people inside our church and outside our walls is so important to us. Every week, people just like you volunteer their time to serve in our lobbies, kids' classes, parking lots, production teams, pretty much everywhere. Our volunteers are the heart of our church. So if you're currently on one of our volunteer teams, we want to say thank you for giving your time and serving with us. And if you'd like to volunteer here with us, you can jump in at any time to take a test drive and find out the right fit for you. Just fill out the blue serve card in your seat back and drop it in the giving bags later today. Thanks so much for being here with us today. We believe you're here for a reason. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you're at. And our hope is that today you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. If you have questions about anything you've heard today or just want to find out more about the church, stop by the Connect Center in the lobby or visit us online at faithauburn.org. We hope you have a great weekend. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Faith. We're glad you guys are with us today. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm kicking off this series called Love Goals, and it is based around the idea of something that's on my wrist here. Um, raise your hand if you have a, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or something like that that tracks your steps and tracks your physical activity. Yeah, I got one of these nine months ago, and uh, it's funny because the week before my birthday, my dad... We were sitting in my living room, and he's like, hey, would you ever want an Apple Watch or a Fitbit? And I was like, I'll never use that. Well, Kendall was sitting next to me, and she had already bought one for me for my birthday. And so <laughs> I opened it. I was like, oh, yay, thanks. <laughs> but uh, nine months later, I find myself using this thing more than anything else. I mean, it's, it's funny how that works. Um, but what I do is I actually put it on before I go to bed. I keep it on, and I set my alarm on here, and that way I don't have to wake up the whole house with my alarm clock, beep, beep, beep. Instead, it just taps my arm, wake up, wake up, wake up, and it's convenient. I, you know, I just keep my toddler sleeping. I don't have to wake her up, and uh, so I do that. I can also see that it is 60 degrees outside right now. It's getting hotter, yeah. Winter's over, thankfully. And I can also read text messages, emails. I mean, I can, I can do a lot on this thing. But one of the reasons that people really want these uh, more than any of those reasons is that it tracks your physical activity. It tracks your fitness goals. So you've got your uh, stand goals. You have your move goals. You have your exercise goals. And, um, you know, what's, what's really cool about it is it will actually guilt trip you if throughout the day you haven't met your goals, it'll give you little nudges like, hey, you haven't stood in the past three hours. It's time to stand up, you know, or like my favorite is when Kendall and I like lay down, we go to bed, it's like 11 p.m. at night and my watch will alert me. I roll over, say, sorry, babe, I'm going to go on a 22 minute jog. I'll be right back, <laughs> you know, and just like it gets annoying after a while that it, it's just guilting me and saying, you're not that physical, <laughs> but we were thinking with this series, what would it look like if we had a device that measured how much we loved people that day? You know, if we had a, a, a watch that would say, you know, hey, you, uh, you did great today. You forgave a lot of people. You, uh, you, you reached out to that friend who was going through a hard time. You, you showed mercy to that person. You, you loved people as Jesus calls you to love people. I, I think every day I'd go to bed feeling like a better person. I don't know about you, but I would. Um, no, actually, no, I don't think I would at all. I think that I would get to the end of the day and feel just as guilty, like I got a lot of work to do. 
And I think we'd all feel that way, that we don't really love as much as God calls us to love. It was two commands he gave us, you know, love God and love people. And so, so why is it so hard to love people? And that's kind of the idea behind this series for the next five weeks. We'll be talking about how do we, how do we live out these love goals that, that God's called us to. And uh, so today, we're, we're talking about this idea of we live in a, in a culture, in a world, that there's so much hatred today. There's so much division today. I mean, people today are flipping out and flipping the bird, you know. And the other, the other day, just last week, I was driving, and I'm trying to pull into this parking lot, but there's someone coming out of the entrance. And so I'm just kind of sitting there, like, waiting, you know, in that awkward, like, okay, I'm just going to wait and let you pull out. But they weren't pulling out. And then this guy comes up behind me, and he lays on his horn. And so as he's laying on this horn, this woman that is pulling out thinks that I'm honking at her. So she looks at me, smiles, and flips me the bird. I'm just like, <laughs> what did I do? I didn't do anything. Like, I'm caught, but yeah, I'm caught in the, between a rock and a hard place. I can't do anything. And, uh, you know, it's easy to brush that off to say, like, oh, I'll never see her again, whatever. But it's harder to love people that are closest to us when, when you know, maybe it's in a marriage, like you got into a marriage because of those qualities you loved about that person, but now, you know, years into the marriage, it's those same qualities that, that tend to have the most conflict around. You know, you loved that they were an extrovert and you were an introvert and they just were so different than you, but now when you come home and, and all you want to do is just like be silent because the work has been so busy and buzzy that your spouse is like, how's your day? How's it going? You know, like maybe that is for you the thing that like, oh, it's the tension. How do I love this person when they're so different from me? Maybe it's your kids. You know, you'd say, I love my kids unconditionally, except the only condition is that they don't scream their heads off the entire day right? Like, how do I love my, my kids when they just get under, they know, they, they press points, they know the pressure points of my soul, and they just get into my head, you know? Maybe it's a friend that you, uh, you guys started off great, but just over time, they're not very easy to love. They've got these qualities about them that it's like, how do I, how do I love this person? They're, they're, they've got such rough edges about them. How about in the church? Do we love each other? Yeah, we're great at it, right? <laughs> there's, a, there, there's a hymn that says, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And it's based off of John 13 in the Bible where, where Jesus said, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So, so that's the idea is that we are called to be a community that loves one another. But... The problem is, and, and why this is so important. In fact, I'm just going to get into the, the, the tension right here. Why are the people you love so hard to love? Why are the people that you love so hard to love? And, and I might even just point this, point the finger at you. Why are you people so hard to love? Why are you so hard to love? I mean, why do I find myself having a hard time loving some of you? You know? And like, I'm, I'm joking, obviously. But like, in reality... Why do we sometimes rub each other the wrong way when we, we, we butt heads? And why, why do we send each other emails and, and, and say things over text that we would never say face to face? And why do we gossip behind each other's backs? Why do we slander someone? Why do we uh, do the things we do and say the things we say? You know, if we were to really recognize that, like, we're called to be a community that loves each other. And so the, the, why this is so important and why we need to discover the answer to this question is because we're not known by our love. We're not. You know, that, that hymn, we're know, that they'll know us by our love. They don't know us by our love. In fact, the world, 85% of unchurched millennials think that Christians are hypocritical. 85% think that we're hypocritical. <sighs> that we say one thing and we do another. And so this is a problem for us. Like, we need to figure this out so that we can be a community, again, that reflects the love of Christ, that is attractive to the world. Otherwise, it's like, sometimes I look at the relationships in the church, and I look at the relationships outside of the church, and it's hard to tell the difference. Ouch. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm including myself in this, too, guys, because this is something that I think is the human condition. I think it's something that's inherent in each and every one of us. And to discover the answer to this question requires some 
some digging beneath the surface. And so, if you're not a Christian, if, if maybe you got dragged here today by a friend, uh, you know, by, by someone you're just kind of investigating or on the fence, welcome. Welcome to the dysfunctional family of God. <laughs> and, um, you know, it might feel like you got invited to, like, that family dinner party, and then, like, five minutes in, Dad just yelled at the whole family, and you're like, what is going on? So I just want to say, like, up front, this message is not for you. You can sit back and relax and know, like, uh, just, just let it go in one ear, out the other if you want. This message, but, but I hope that you get, kind of get a sneak peek into the kind of community that God calls us to be so that once again we would be that place that would be attractive to you, a place that would be a, a, a body of people that love each other unconditionally to the best of our ability. And so the answer to this question I think is so important and vital for us. And the, and the most amazing thing is that God hasn't just like dropped us on this planet to be like, figure it out, love each other, peace. No, he's given us something called the Bible that we can run to and find meaning and find answers to these questions. And so that's what we're gonna do today is we're gonna jump into the book of 1 John chapter one. Now, 1 John is in the New Testament. If you flip to the back of the Bible and work your way from the back, you'll find it. It's only the fifth um, to last book of the Bible out of the 66 books. So it's way back there. And John... This is not John the Baptist. Um, This is a different John. This is John the disciple, John the apostle. He followed Jesus. He was a fisherman, and God, Jesus, called John and said, follow me. So John was one of the 12 disciples who followed Jesus. He was actually, out of the 12 disciples, there were three disciples that were even closer to Jesus, and and John was one of them. John was the, the, the one that, when he writes the gospel, because John also writes the gospel of John, he says, the one who Jesus loved. That's how he refers to himself. It sounds a little narcissistic, but you know, he, he means well. And so that's John for you. But John and his brother James got a nickname by Jesus. Anybody know the nickname? Sons of Thunder, I heard somebody say. It. Sons of Thunder. How would you like to be called that? Son of Thunder. I think of Thor, you know, like <laughs> Son of Thunder. But no, I don't think Jesus was meaning that in a good way. And in fact, uh, in one of the Gospels, we see this story of this Sons of Thunder being played out, where Jesus and the disciples are traveling to Jerusalem, because they're Jewish, and they're traveling through the, the town of Samaria. And as they're going through, Samaritans and Jewish people did not get along. They hated each other. They butt heads against each other all the time. So here's this group of 12 disciples and Jesus walking through Samaria, and they're trying to find a place to stay. And Jesus is met with all kinds of opposition of people who are just like, no, I'm sorry, we're not, there's, you're not welcome here because you're Jewish and we're Samaritans. And so what do the sons of thunder say? They say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and strike them dead, like smite them? <laughs> and Jesus rebukes them. But have you ever felt that kind of like anger? You know, when someone like says something negative about you or to you, you just want to be like, God, would you just smite them right now? <laughs> I think if we're honest, like, we've prayed that prayer before. Like, we've all had that thought, like, oh, that person, I just, I hate them, I hate them. How do we, how do we love someone? How do we love those people? Well, that's the question that we're going to address today, and that's the question that I think John has come to discover, because John is much older when he writes this letter, 1 John 1. He's much older He's much wiser. In fact, he's no longer called the son of thunder. He is now called the apostle of love. That he has learned a thing or two about love because he has been in that inner circle with Jesus, the king of love, the, the, the person who has loved the greatest. And so John spent a lot of time with Jesus, so I think he has a thing or two to say about love. And he's writing to this church, actually a group of churches, that where there was this idea seeping in. You may have heard this before if you grew up in the church. You may not have. It's called Gnosticism. And it wasn't full-fledged yet. It was just the beginnings of this idea of Gnosticism, which is the body is evil, the spirit is good. And so what that means is that it doesn't matter what I do in my body. All that matters is that I'm a Christian, that, that, that my status with God. So it's that idea that like I'm righteous, but I don't have to live righteously. Like, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter if I treat people certain ways. Because, and, and what happens is then you get this spiritual pride. And that's what was happening in the church. It's like people saying, I'm better than you. I'm better than you. And people just one-upping each other. You know, you, you know that person 
in, in the room that's always has to one-up you with every single story you say, you know, just has to, oh, yeah, you had cancer. My dog had cancer, and it was really bad, you know, and, like, just that person that, that, that just, like, turns everything into attention for them. And, and there's this spiritual pride that can really just seep into our church sometimes, I think. I think that we wouldn't call it Gnosticism, but we'd say that some of us, we love God, but it doesn't really matter if I love people. Like, that's, that's the most important thing. My vertical love, horizontal, doesn't really matter. And John's gonna say, no, I'm sorry. The two are connected. So as we, we jump into this, let's jump in to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of this whole letter to these churches. He says this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So John is saying, that which was from the beginning, Jesus was from the beginning, he became flesh. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him, and because he was human, you know, he was fully God and fully human, I think they probably smelled him too, because like his feet were probably pretty dirty because he's fully human. So I mean, like almost all the senses are involved here. They're saying, what John's saying is, he was real. We saw him. I saw him. I experienced this. I shared this moment and these moments with him. And this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That's that gospel proclaiming, proclaiming the good news. And he goes on. He says this. Um, let me go back one. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So Jesus appeared We've seen it, we testify to it, and uh, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So let's go on talking about this proclamation. We proclaim to you what we have seen, oh, wait, yeah, there it is. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. So there's the, that clause there, so that. The whole reason for proclaiming what John's doing, the whole reason I'm telling you about Jesus, the whole reason I'm preaching the gospel is so that you would have fellowship with us. Fellowship. Have you heard that word before? Maybe if you, you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring. Um, but fellowship is the idea of sharing in the common interests with someone else, sharing in a common goal with someone else. We live in a culture where I think everyone is longing for that commonality. We're longing to belong. We want to find a community f to which we can really feel that connection, that, that these interests, these things that I have, I want to have in common with someone else. It's easier to fit in there than it is for me to be with people who are not like me. And so you look at the world, you look at, I mean, let's just talk high school. You look at a high school you know, I don't know how it was back in like the 50s, but I feel like there was not as many clubs and things as there are today. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you look, there's the debate club, the drama club, they all the sports, you know, soccer, football, basketball, track, track and field, you know, all the different things. You got music, you got art, you got choir, all the different things. And kids today are so tribal is the word that, that's being used. They fit into these tribes you know, and you fit into this tribe and, and you find these people that you can identify with. And, and it, it's a good thing, but it's also kind of a dividing thing because now I identify with these people, not with those people, not with those people. Now, that graduates beyond high school to adult life where now we just, you know, we joke about it, but it's like Red Sox and Yankees, right? That's my tribe, Red Sox, Yankees. And it's not bad to have like, you know, common values, common interests with other people, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, you know, but, but then we get into Republican, Democrat, you know, the, the donkey and the elephant, right? And there is something that Christ calls us to that is so much greater than this. You know, if, if it weren't for Christ, many of us in this room would have nothing in common. But because of Christ, we have everything in common. Because of Christ, we have everything in common. And that's why, you know, the Bible says things like every nation, every tribe, every tongue would be united together in this gospel, this good news that Jesus loves us. And, and, and those other common interests you have with other people do not compare to the common interests you have with the community of God. And so that's the good news, that we share in the fellowship with other believers in this. Fellowship is not 
a fellowship hall. You know, if, if you've been to a church before that has a fellowship hall, it's where all the banquets and the potlucks happen. And that's where we do fellowship, right there. You know, when we go home, we don't do fellowship anymore, but it's in that hall. No, fellowship is not a place you go. It's a thing you do. It's a, it's a practice you live out. Fellowship is not about what political party. Po- fellowship is not about, you know, worshiping the donkey or the elephant. It's about worshiping the lamb. It's about the lamb of God. And so that's what unites us together. And so let's jump a little bit further here. He goes on. He says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. So he's making a connection here. He's saying our fellowship, when we have fellowship with each other, we also have fellowship with the Father and with Jesus. So fellowship with people is linked directly to fellowship with God. And what's so crazy about this is he says, so that the whole purpose of the gospel is not so you would be saved from a scary place. That's not, you know, sometimes I think we dumb things down and we say like, we try to scare people into, you don't want to go to hell because it's, it's scary. There's a lot of flames there. There's people, they're really mean and you're going to get hurt there. No, the, the worst part about hell is it's the absolute absence of God. It is the absolute absence of God. So the whole purpose for proclaiming the gospel is, is not even just salvation. Salvation for the purpose of fellowship with God. That's the whole reason we exist. That's the reason we were created, not to be saved from someplace or not to be saved so we can, hey, I'm going to go to heaven because there's gold-plated streets, which is going to be pretty amazing. But it's more than that. It's that we get to be with Jesus, with God eternally. But I think a lot of us, we settle for this, this idea of, I want a scholarship to heaven instead of fellowship with heaven right now. We can have fellowship with God right now. And so the question is for us, you know, do you have fellowship with God? Before we jump in and say, oh, of course I do. I come to church. I do all these things. I, I follow all the rules. Let's go on. Because he says this. He says, we write this. The whole reason we're saying this to you is to make our joy complete. And there's some versions uh, that say your joy complete. But I think it's safe to say this joy is available to anyone who participates in fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That there's this fullness of joy. And you felt it before. If you felt it, you would know. Because there's this joy you experience when you go on a missions trip and you feel that fellowship with people. You feel like connected to these people. You feel connected to God. Isn't that the most amazing feeling, to feel that fullness of joy? We've got a missions trip coming up in, uh, in July. We've got a lot of people going to, uh, to Puerto Rico. And it's that fellowship you experience when you go off together with a group of people. It's that fellowship you experience when you're in a small group with a group of people. That, that fellowship you experience. You know, and that's the fullness of joy. But I'll tell you, I don't always feel this fullness of joy. And so I have to come back to the question, am I always experiencing fellowship with God? And I'll just tell you that the answer is no. And I think the answer is no for you too. We, we have those seasons where we experience fellowship with God, some of us more often than not, but it's hard to stay in that place. And I'm gonna get into later on why, what this has to do with loving each other. So let's, let's go on, because now John's gonna give us a little bit more information on the conditions for this fellowship with God. How do, we, how do we have fellowship? So in order to have fellowship with God, we gotta understand something about God, and this is where he says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. God is light. There is no darkness at all. I remember um, going on a trip down to Georgia a few years ago, and we walked into the hotel room, and we flipped the light on, and you just see the things scatter. <laughs> it's like, I am not staying here. This is, no, not doing that. <laughs> but in the, the light of God's presence, there's no place for things to scatter to. I mean, darkness can't hide. Cockroaches can't hide. There's no shadows in his presence. It's the fullness of light. And so, if that's who God is, what would it look like for me to have fellowship with him? Let's, let's read on. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Whew. Just let that sink in for a second. 
if we claim to have fellowship with him. I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts this in the message translation. He says this. He says, if we claim that we experience a shared life with him and continue to stumble around in the dark. If, if we claim that we have this shared experience, that's the idea of fellowship, is to share in, 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 in your life with God, to invite him into that. So if, if God is all light, then what would it look like for me to share in the experience of my life with him? It would mean that the darkest parts of my soul are exposed in the magnitude of his light. It would mean that the things that I'm afraid to tell people cannot hide. And so I think a lot of us, we don't want to get to that place because we're afraid of what would happen if we were found out. If God were to find out and he were to see who I really am, we're afraid. And so he says we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. Coming back to um, these little devices, the Apple Watch, sometimes I don't always exercise and sometimes I um, binge watch like The Office for five hours on my couch. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'll be just laying on my couch for a long period of time and then my watch will tell me, congratulations, you hit your stand goal. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? Well, what I've come to find out by reading articles is that you can actually fake your watch out and make it think that you're doing physical activity. If you just, you know, flick your wrist down, it thinks you stood up. And uh, there's an article on this. Someone's like, oh yeah, you can trick your watch. It's like, what's the point? Why? Like, you are lying. Not, no, there's nobody that's like checking. Your spouse isn't like, make sure he uh, did his physical activity for today. You know, that's for you. Like, God's, God's saying to us, like, why would you cheat on your physical activity to make yourself feel better about yourself? You know the truth. So why do we do this with God? Why, why do we come before him and say, yeah, I'm, uh, here's all of me, God. I'm, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I read my Bible every day. I don't drink beer. I, I don't watch R-rated movies. I uh, do everything right that I'm supposed to do. And yet there's this pride in our heart that I'm afraid for him to find out about because I'm, I have this spiritual, like, I'm better than you. You know, it, it, like, why? We're, we're obviously, we're, we're lying through our teeth. We're lying to ourselves is what John would later say. We're not lying to anybody else because everybody else can pretty much see when you're lying. And so the question for us is, is how do we walk in this, this presence of God, in this fellowship with God? And he goes on to say this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. You know what's interesting is he says if we claim to have fellowship with God, that's like I can say, I can say the right things, speak all I want, but we're, our lives are not measured in words but in walking. Our lives are not measured in the words we say but in what we do with our lives, how we live our lives. And so if we walk in the light as he is in the light, what that means is that when I come to God, all of my sin is, is there before him. That I don't have to hold anything back. I don't have to be afraid because it's all there. and He, all, he knows it all anyway. And so as we walk in the light, it doesn't mean that I clean myself up before I come to God. You know, oh God, I'll walk in the light, but let me just deal with this in the darkness first and then I'll come to you. It's not like I come to the, to, the, to the light with this mask on, like, hey, uh, am I doing it right, God? Am I living the way I'm supposed to live? No, he's saying, come. I want to see you for who you are because I want you to experience something that's more than what you could experience from anyone else. So he says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God. That's what you expect it to say. We have fellowship with God. But he takes it a step further and says, when you have fellowship with God by walking in the light, you have fellowship with one another. That's what it's all about right there. Like, how do we love those who are hard to love? How do we have fellowship is really kind of another way of asking that question. By walking in the light as he is in the light. See, I think John understands something that, that is beneath the surface here because our love for each other or our lack of love, the, the way that we lash out at each other, that's a symptom of a deeper problem. The deeper problem is this, that we have not spent time with our Father, our Heavenly Father, 
and shared in the experience of who he says we are. You know, when we miss out on that time with God, when we, when we just run away from God and just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join a church because there's some nice people there, people are gonna let us down. Like nobody can be God for you. That marriage, that's why we rush into marriage. That's why we rush into relationships because this person can fill that void in my heart. No, God can only fill that void. Don't run, don't expect other people to give you what only God can give you. That's why we run, that's why we're enslaved to our addictions because if we really had that fellowship, that oneness with God, that, that, that all sufficiency of that would be enough. That, that's why we, 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 we struggle in, in the way that we relate to one another. That's why we gossip about other people because we don't feel secure in ourselves, so we have to make someone else feel insecure or make ourselves feel better by putting someone down. And it all stems from the issue that's deep-rooted in our souls, every single one of us, is that we're longing to belong somewhere to someone, and that can only truly be met in Christ can only be met in God. My spouse, she's awesome, but she can't be my God. She can't. And when I put her on that pedestal and I expect her to be someone that she's not, she's going to constantly let me down. She's going to constantly not live up to my expectations. And so a lot of this has to do with the idea that God wants to share in that, that fellowship with you. He wants to share He wants you to share your life with him. And and not so he can just condemn you, so he can say, see, I knew you had a problem, and you were hiding it from me. No, God's not surprised by our sin. He, He goes on, he says this. John says, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It's 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 this purification. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. See, we don't just need fellowship with God to be honest. We need it to be pure. I think New Englanders, we love to be honest. Like, we're like, take me as I am. This is who I am. I'm going to be tough and, you know, I don't even know. But, you know, I love my Red Sox and all that, you know. And we love to be tough and, and just, like, take me as I am. But what we're, we're lacking is that purity aspect. That, yes, be honest with God and with people, but there should be a pathway towards purity for your life. And that's what God wants to do. Now, this isn't like a once and for all. I prayed a prayer when I was like 13 years old and God purified me then. I'm good now. Yeah, I don't really struggle with anything anymore. Like, I'm all good with God. No, this is a, a continual, continual, daily, hourly, minutely, secondly, I don't even know. Just continually living in the presence of God and allowing and, and sharing in your life with him. Because remember that fellowship with God is the ultimate goal of, of our entire lives. And, and so God wants to share in that experience with us. And when we share in that, we are purified. As, as I bring the darkest parts of my soul to God, it gets bleached out in his light. It gets wiped clean by his blood. And that's my hope, is that if you haven't experienced that fellowship with God, that oneness with God, the chances are you are not feeling the security that comes from knowing whose you are. Knowing that, that your, your life is hidden in Christ with God. That, that, that the, the people around you do not determine your worth. God determines your worth. So the big point this morning is this. A shared life is a secure life. A shared life is a secure life. When we share our lives with God, you feel that security. If you've felt it before, you know what I'm talking about. That security that just, there's nothing anyone can do. There's nothing anyone can say that would wreck this for me because I know that I know that I know that my heavenly father loves me. You know, we sing a song, we just start singing, I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am, not who my 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 spouse says I am, not who my daughter who's ran off says I am. I'm not who my ex says I am. I'm not who my, my, my teacher says I am. I am who God says I am. 
And when you, when you share your life with Christ, you, you feel that security. So next time you're in that traffic jam, if you're walking in the light, there's no traffic jam that can get to your soul. There's no traffic jam that can wreck this security you feel. When you walk in the light, you learn to see people as God sees them. And you begin to recognize that one upping is bids for attention, not threats to your existence. And rather than react to people, now you begin to see that, that every single person on this planet is screaming, love me, love me, love me. And the only cure for that is fellowship with God. And when you experience that, now you don't treat people as means to an end, but you see them as the children of God that God has created them to be uniquely made. And it's not easy. There are people in this world that are hard to love. And there are people in this world that need tough love. And this is not about that. This is about our hearts, what's going on before we get there. We've got four more weeks to talk about that. But this starts in the heart. It starts with that fellowship with God. So how do we get there? How? How do we have fellowship with God? Just like stepping into the light, is it that easy? There's one way to get into the light. Only one way. And John says it a couple of verses later. He says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins. You know what's so amazing about confession? You know, just like blot out any preconceived ideas you have about confession of like sitting in a booth with someone and telling them all your deepest and darkest secrets and getting that, you know, whatever it is, a judgment or, or being afraid that God's going to like punish me uh, because uh, he, he's going to find out. No, confession is to say the same thing as God. That's literally what the Greek word means. Hamalageo is to say the same thing, to call your sin the same thing that God calls it. So when you stand in the light with God, in the fellowship with him, you look at your sin in the darkness and you call it what it is. You say, God, I'm sorry. That thing I did last week, that, that word I said to that person an hour ago, that's sin. I confess that to you, God. And what does it say? What is the result? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful because he's, he's made promises and he doesn't back down on his promises. His promise is that I will never, I, I will remember your sins no more. That I will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. I will remember them no more. And he's just. How is he just? You know, sometimes when you think of justice, you think of violence, of retribution, of vengeance. Like, I, I, you, know, you know, if you punish your kid, it's, it's because, you know, well, I have to punish you. I have to do this. God is just to forgive. What does that mean? That means he's already paid the punishment. He's already paid that price. And so when you are afraid to walk into the light because you're afraid of God punishing you, know this, the punishment has already taken place. And that's, that's what this table is all about. Communion. Sharing in the, the, the punishment that Christ took upon himself. And as often as we do communion, we, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So before we take communion, before we sing one more song, I want us to just end this message, this time, in a time of silent confession. Silent confession. I'm not asking anybody to stand up and shout out your, your deepest and darkest secrets. But this would be a silent time of confession. This is just between you and God. You don't have to say anything out loud. This can be in your heart. You can say, you can whisper if you want. No one's listening. No one's going to write anything down. This is between you and God to confess. But let me just say this. This is not a once and for all thing. This is an ongoing, continual purification, but continual confession. And so this is for the greatest sinners and the greatest saints. Like you don't graduate beyond the need for confession. In fact, every day and every moment, we need 
to continue to confess. And so this is the opportunity for us to walk into the light again by confessing and saying the same thing that God says about our sin. So as we spend just three, four minutes in, in silence, if you've never confessed before, if you've never done this before, I'm gonna put some passages up on the screen that are gonna kind of guide you through this process. And you can read those. You can just say them in your mind out loud if you want. Or if you wanna use them as a guide to kind of help you to formulate a prayer to God, a confession to God. But the whole purpose of this is so you would walk in the light because it's better for you to be in the light and uncomfortable than to continue walking in darkness and lying to yourself. Yeah, I'm a good Christian. That's my tricking my Apple Watch, by the way. <laughs> let's, let's get real. Let's stop faking. Let's get in the light. Let's confess the things that God already knows. Because he just wants you to say the same thing that he's been saying. So let's just spend some time in silence. The light's going to go down. And then we're going to take communion together and sing a song. night that Jesus was betrayed he's sitting around the table with the disciples John was there he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks he said this is my body which is broken for you as often as you do this do it in remembrance of me and likewise took the cup and after they were done eating he took the cup and he said this is the cup of the new covenant represents my blood poured out for you as often as you take this do it in remembrance of me as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes proclaim, we, we preach the gospel until he comes back so that we can have fellowship with him. When we do this, 
we share in a commonality with saints from the early church all the way to today, throughout all those years who have done this. We share in the fellowship with each other. We share in the fellowship with God. You don't have to be a member of this church to take communion, but you gotta be a member of the family of God. And all that means is that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You give your life to him. If you haven't come to that place, if you're still on the fence, that's okay. But if you want that fellowship, that belonging that you've been searching for, come and talk to myself, talk to another one of the pastors afterward. And we wanna pray for you. We wanna help you take that step. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna invite the ushers right now to come, come forward. And as they're coming forward, we're gonna be passing communion out. And at the very end, after the song is over, we're gonna take communion together. So you can hold it until then. But uh, let's just spend this time taking communion together.
communion yet, but those of you who have, let's take and eat together. Let's take the cup together. Well, this is a good series. I'm excited about it. Hope you don't feel too beat up on this morning. <laughs> but my prayer for us is as we go, that we would be the church, the community that God's called us to be. A community where love one another isn't just something that's on a wall somewhere, but something that we live out each and every day. A community where each of us are secure not in what other people say about us, but in who we are because who Christ calls us to be. A, a community where kids grow up in houses where their, their parents are emotionally healthy and that emotional health leads into every area of their lives. That's our hope that over the next four weeks, if we even just take one step towards that. So thanks so much for coming today. Let's just continue loving each other, confessing our sins to our God every single day this week and living out in that fellowship with God. Thanks so much for coming. We hope to see you next week. Just a reminder too that if you're new with us, there's a welcome reception happening in, in the lobby. If you wanna you know, say hi and uh, it'd be great to just meet some of you. So we'll, we'll see you there.